Hello you guys and welcome back to my channel. Today we are starting a brand new series that I'm very excited for and essentially what it is is that I pick apart and analyze TV shows, movies, books, etc. that are very popular right now and tell you guys what they can teach you about how to write or what they can teach you about what not to do in your writing. So I'm very excited for this. I've been wanting to do this for literally ages because I myself don't consume media. I uh, analyze, pick apart, and just completely either bash on or love media. And so I've been wanting to do this for ages because I had to pick apart and find things that I feel like will help me in my own storytelling because all movies, TV shows, other books, it's all storytelling just through different mediums. Hell, even songs and albums, I could even do those for you guys. Um, however, I'm struggling with a name for what to call this series. So if you have any ideas for what I could name it, do tell me down below um, and then maybe I'll pick one of you guys and shout you out and uh, all the goodies and use that name from now on. So I don't know what this series is gonna be called, but it's gonna be where we analyze things. So again, if you have any recommendations for TV shows, movies, books, albums, songs, artists, etc., do tell me down below as well and then maybe I will pick one of those to consume, analyze, and then spit back out for you guys. And these can be bad things as well. They don't have to be your favorite TV show. They could be your least favorite TV show. And I'll explain why you should not do what those writers did. Also, sorry, before we begin, yes, I lightened my hair. If you can tell, it's kind of a grease ball right now. So it's not as obvious. <laughs> Today, we're starting out with the wonderful Umbrella Academy because I finished binge watching that the other day and it's just so fucking good. Um, we're not talking about the TV, the, we're not talking about the comics though because I have not read them. I'm just talking about the TV show. So do give this uh, video a big old thumbs up if you're excited for season two. Whenever that comes out, there better be a fucking season two. I'm looking at you, Netflix. So obviously, spoilers for the first season of The Umbrella Academy. So if this is not for you, go watch the show. Come back. We can have a discussion, especially down in the comments down below. However, this is not going to be a spoiler for the comics just for the first season of the TV show. So if you're watching this from the future and you're like, oh no, I'm gonna get spoilers for the second season, I haven't seen it yet. No, it's just for the first season, just from the TV show, not from the comics. Now, to break down the three biggest things you can get from the Umbrella Academy, I've broken it into three elements that we were going to talk about today. And that is the before life, family dynamic, and the character rebirth versus destroy. And I'll explain what all of those are so I've done any more. So the before life is, in essence, the life before the inciting incident, and the TV show starts off with this very, very well. Some books and some movies and media decide to just skip and start the story right off from the inciting incident, but this show does a very awesome job of making you interested in the lives of the characters before the big thing happens. And the inciting incident of this TV show is their father dying, of course. This TV show is a fantastic example of showing your characters' lives before the big change happens, of showing the before life of the story. And this element allows you to show the dramatic shift between the previous life and the end of the character arc that the character goes through in the first season, first episode, first chapter, even, you know, the first book, for example. Because character arcs, as we know, is not just one arc, especially if you're having something like a series or a TV show. People go through arcs, you know, small ones and chapters and specific scenes they can, and through each and every single book they go through an arc. If there's multiple books, every arc has a book, and then there's the major arc that connects all of the books in a series together. It doesn't matter how long the series is, that entire series and their transformation is their main character arc, their big one, but even in each book they make smaller arcs. And having a before life kind of sequence in the beginning shows you how drastic of a change they're making as characters within all of their arcs. So you can juxtapose the beginning from the ending of the arc. The smaller ones and the bigger ones. This is also a really good thing to do because sometimes when we don't know how the character was before we don't know how they have changed. This is also a really important idea to implement into your stories if you're having multiple books because sometimes it's really hard to see the changing arc from such a distance. When you have like a six book series, for example, it's kind of hard to see how the characters have changed, especially when you start off in book like two, for example, and the characters already went through a shift. So then your mind kind of trace plays tricks on you as a reader and makes you think, okay, that is who the character is and that's how they've always been, when really it's before book one is how they have always been. Their transformation began on the page at the beginning of the first book. So when you go and you're allowed to show this before life in the beginning, you can juxtapose it to the ending because you can show this is before everything happened, this is 
how they ended up um, from life circumstances and then through the story this is how they ended up after their change. This is before the change, after the change. If you start off with the inside incident, they're already starting with the change. Some people can pull it off, some books it works, sometimes it does not. So this is an example of when you want to implement it. It's a great show to watch, even just the first like five minutes of the show. Catches you up to speed on six different people's lives, how they have changed and how they're going to go and meet up together essentially after years of being apart. Um, and they all react differently to the inciting incident, but the underlying feeling of all of it is shock and sort of dread almost. And that is kind of the mood it opens up with. But then by the end of the season, uh, spoilers again, uh, you have more of a feeling of hope as they're looking up into this bright light, essentially. It's not as dark and gloomy, but it is still a feeling of dread because you don't know what's going to happen next. We can have our theories and everything, but that's a whole nother video. So for example, Vanya is playing the violin at the beginning of the first episode and she's playing to an auditorium that is completely empty. Meanwhile, at the end of the season, she's playing to a full-on raving crowd. And that is to show how the characters have undergone a change in the season or the book. So you can see that it's very, very juxtaposed. They're doing the same, she's doing the same exact action, but because there's an audience, it means something completely different. Then you have Luther, number one, and he's <laughs> on the fucking moon at the start of the TV show, and by the end he knows he's never coming back. If anything, he kind of got slammed back into Earth and kind of uh, got his head out of the clouds in a certain way um, uh, because of the reveals that were made. Diego is being his usual vigilante self, but then by the end of the season you know he's actually just a janitor. Allison is seemingly this big shot movie star, who's got everything together and she's all perfectly placed together and you know she's got the limelight on her and everything but then meanwhile by the end of the season she's just as big of a mess as the rest of her siblings and klaus our dear baby boy literally almost dies of an overdose at the very beginning of the episode the very first episode that's basically our introduction to him is getting out of a halfway house and then almost dying from an overdose and then meanwhile versus the end of the season, he is essentially the glue that tries to keep everybody together, especially Luther, as he goes off the rails, and he's trying not to have Luther fall down the steps that he did. And it's very- his arc is probably my absolute favorite, because you go from almost dying from an overdose to fighting your own demons to try and protect your brother from doing the same thing that you did. Two, we're talking about family dynamics here because that is the bread and butter of the entire show. It is what they do so, 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 so absolutely well. And if you take away anything from here, it should be this number two family dynamic aspect because a lot of people in their novels do not get family dynamics right. A lot of the times in what I see, especially in the YA realm, is that either the family is non-existent, there's one sibling that they constantly spat with, or they absolutely love their sibling and would do anything for them. But there's nothing in between. There's no nuance. There's no my family is here and we have an estranged relationship but I still care about them. There is no I love my brother to death but I would kick his ass in a second if given the chance. And that's, let's face it, is usually more of the relationships between siblings. This show does an amazing example of showing how a bunch of siblings can love each other and hate each other all at the same time. And it's not confusing because the things that they do are relatable to anyone with siblings. Anyways. <laughs> One of my favorite sibling relationships in the TV show is between Vanya and Allison because they're very at odds in the beginning but then you can still tell that they care about each other and the reason that they're at odds is because they care about each other and they both kind of feel betrayed by one another. Meanwhile, by the end of the season you have the biggest betrayal of all which is Vanya's actions that are absolutely so horrific but despite that, Allison still never gives up on her. Meanwhile, you have Diego and Luther who are completely at odds with one another at all times because they're the exact opposite of each other. Diego is a vigilante. Meanwhile, Luther literally cannot help himself from following every single one of his father's rules, even when it deforms his body and sends him to the moon where he is completely and utterly alone for years and wastes his life in essence. Meanwhile, you have Klaus and Ben's weird uh, sibling dynamic from beyond the grave that really shows why Klaus went down the path that he did with all the drugs and the drinking and the partying and blah 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 blah. <laughs> All the things that are wrong with Klaus, uh, which are the same reasons why we love him. But it's a unique dynamic that helps you understand why Klaus has done the things that he has done. Especially when you get flashbacks of his childhood with their father and realize how fucked up it was to lock a child in a crypt. And then, you know, having your sibling die and hang around with you. Um, 
it's a lot. <laughs> and outside of sibling dynamics, the show does an amazing job of showing Diego and his mother's dynamic. Diego loves his mom so absolutely much, and you can see it from the very first time that they even lay eyes on each other. The other siblings sort of have this, well, she's a robot kind of thing. Um, that kind of distances them from the motherly robot that their father created to take care of them. Meanwhile, Diego does not care. He has an absolute love for this machine, and you can tell that even though it's a machine, it has an absolute soft spot in its core for him, and you don't know exactly how that works, but you can tell that they have this bond that the rest of the siblings don't, and he loves her so absolutely much. And he's the only one of all the siblings who does not want to restart or turn off the robotic mother, even when seemingly her malfunctioning caused their father to die. But when he discovered that she was hurting herself due to her malfunctioning, he couldn't stand the sight of her putting herself in harm's way, and he couldn't stand looking at it, he couldn't stand that she was not herself anymore. She was no longer the person who had raised him, and it absolutely broke his heart, and that scene I literally cried at. I was like, oh my god, I don't- I didn't even like Diego that much at that point, but I was like, oh my god, I feel for you, poor baby. And that dynamic of being willing to hurt yourself so that someone else will stop hurting themselves is such an interesting, heartwarming moment, even though it's really, really sad and it's kind of weird. <laughs> the whole show is really weird. <laughs> This all in all is an absolutely amazing show to just watch, one, and then two, to study and analyze for the aspect of families, found families, and their dynamics with each other, the way certain circumstances can shape the relationships between certain people. Meanwhile, that same person can have a completely different relationship with somebody else just because of circumstance, because of attitudes, because of the way people were raised, the environments that they went around. When it changes one person, it changes their way that they act with everybody around them, which changes all their relationships. That's why character arcs, for example, in real life, our personal arcs will take us further away from some people closer to others that we never thought we would be closer to before. And that's because we as people change, your characters need to change. And that can pull you further away from your family, it can pull you closer, it can make you distant from one sibling but super close to the other one. And that is something that more books need to get right. So it's a really great show to get inspiration from to decide whether or not your characters are going to connect or disconnect from their peers. And lastly, number three is the character Rebirth versus Destroy, which is essentially asking yourself, what would push my character to the absolute breaking point and destroy them? And does it actually end up making them better? A lot of people say that you should bring your character to the breaking point. Think of the worst thing that can happen to them and have it happen. However, a lot of these times they just gloss over the impact that that action has on the character. Because of course, you write heroes, right? They should always come out better from the things that they face, except for people in real life do not always come out better from the things that they endure. You saw it right there, all the stuff that Klaus went through when he was a child just made him overdose. The best example I can think of is with Luther and Klaus. Luther basically finds Finds out that his dad sent him away for nothing and wasted his life simply because he was ashamed to look at him. And that he wasted his life even before being sent to the moon by following a madman's orders. And he felt like his father sent him away because he was ashamed and embarrassed by the way he looked, which was the way he looked was due to his own actions. This revelation absolutely broke him. He went off the rails doing drugs and drinking and going on partying and didn't care if he took off his clothes and slept with a strange woman and he just did not care anymore. Meanwhile, Klaus goes back in time and falls in love for the very first time with a man who is destined to die in war. This should have broken someone with Klaus's insane lack of willpower. But instead, he fights tooth and nail to stay sober, to be with Luther when Luther is going off the fucking rails. Klaus starts caring right after Luther stops caring, and it switches the entire dynamic. This is a fantastic point to study when you are crafting your character arcs for your novels. Especially considering how it can show the ups and downs of a character arc, and how not everyone improves from their arc. An arc can completely go downhill and just kind of stay there. And here's the thing that I would like to reiterate to every single author, but not everyone needs to improve from their character arc, and not everyone does. Sometimes characters get worse. And I'm not talking about sometimes they get worse before they get better, sometimes they just get worse. We only ever think about characters getting worse and kind of turning to the dark side when we're talking about our villains or our antagonists. But sometimes characters who are this amazing, incredible hero 
go through things and they don't turn out the same in the end. There's, they make choices. They're not a hero anymore. They can't call themselves that anymore because of the choices they were forced to make or the choices that they did make that they ended up figuring out later on were wrong or the things that they faced, the troubles that they went to, through. Sometimes people just break. And that is not something that I think I see enough from novels. There's always, you go through a transformation and then you end up up here at the end. When that's just the thing, is that if you're going to make your story realistic, if you want to add more dynamics into it, if you want to make it different from what we've already seen, not everyone has to get better. Sometimes they start off on a high and they just slowly go down. It doesn't mean that they have to be a villain at the end, it just means that they're fucked up at the end. I've read some books where some horrible shits happen to people and then they end up perfectly fine in the end and I'm like, I'm sorry. PTSD is a thing. Where's that? Because obviously if you're going through all of this for like a six book series, like you're gonna come out with some shit, you know? And they might still be themselves, they might still have like their good heart, good traits, but that does not necessarily mean that they're coming out of it unscathed. There needs to be consequences to the actions that they've taken, their other characters have taken, characters have taken against them, and other situations such as that. So I think it's very important to decide what kind of dynamic and what kind of things are going to break your character and whether it breaks or it makes them. Because I find it a whole lot more interesting when a character fights tooth and nail to become a better person and they just don't make it. It's a sad reality, but a lot of people just don't make it. And that's the thing, is that you fight tooth and nail to become the person that you want to be. You're going to be 80 years old on your deathbed still wishing you had done one or two things. You know, and you cannot possibly do everything in the world. You cannot possibly become the exact absolute version of yourself that you wish you could be. But you can fight a hell of a lot harder every single day to go and try and be that person. So no, your character at the end of their novel is not going to be the picture perfect version of themselves that they wish they could be. So just study things like the Umbrella Academy and hopefully you can figure out what is going to destroy or what is going to cause a rebirth in your characters. But that's it for me today. I do love this show so much. So again, give me a big ol' thumbs up if you do too. And comment down below if you have any more shows that you would love for me to watch, analyze, and spit back out at you guys. Remember, it can be a bad show, a good show, movies, albums, etc. And if you are excited for this new series, do try to think of a name and tell me if you're interested in this series down below. I would really love to know from you guys. But that is it from me today, so remember to subscribe because I make writing and karma related videos every Friday. So, bye! I know that